Um, it is obviously lovely to be here. I hate it when people start off by saying that, but it genuinely is because obviously I am the telephone assassin. I do speaking and training all around telephone techniques, um, and it's an industry that doesn't have the best reputation out there. Um, can I, by a quick show of hands, who's nice to cold callers that phone them? Anybody hang up on people that cold call them? Have we got many swearers in the room? Um, do you remember when the only game that we had on our mobile phones was something called Snake? Yeah? The screens had that bright neon green or blue glow about them. Yes, there was no colours and things on there. It was quite a simple time then, wasn't it? We were just starting to get used to text messaging, which I think we're all quite familiar with now. We've even created our own sort of mini language that we use, lol. But they're not just phones anymore, are they? They're smartphones. So we now have the ability to use things like social media, which in terms of marketing really allows us to amplify our message and send our message right the way around the world in a matter of a few clicks and shares and likes. But my problem is that most people wander around with a phone in their pocket, yet when you've got bad news or an awkward customer, or something you don't really want to do, we quite often choose to send a text message or an email. Is there anybody in the room that would admit to spending a bit too long to crafting that perfect email? Yes? And it still tends to go out without the attachment or a spelling mistake or something frustrating there as well. The reason that I ask that question is that I find myself guilty of it sometimes too. Um, but the main thing that I try and point out to people is that if you spend the same amount of time, effort and energy thinking about a conversation you would have with that person and what they might say in response to the things you want to tell them, I can guarantee your response rates and your conversion will be much higher picking up the phone than it will ever be sending an email. But don't get me wrong, emails create a paper trail, it's good to be able to send our T's and C's across and, and send things to people. Um, but does anybody get really great success rates with their email campaigns? Hmm, ish. Hit and miss sometimes, isn't it? Depends on the title, apparently. See, what I always say to people when it comes to email campaigns is that um, what I'm really interested in, and I don't really do many email campaigns, as you can imagine, I'm the telephone assassin, so my email campaign consists of me downloading all of my LinkedIn connections, and I send them all a message to say, I've got too many connections to talk to all of you. Um, I'd love to hear, hear about your business and what's going on. Give me a call if you're around. However, if you'd like to come and hear me speak or come to one of my events, these are the things that are in the diary. And I put some links in there and I try and drive them to my website. And hopefully when they get to your website, they fill out your form. They do that, they fill out the form and they pick up the number. They don't always do that though, do they? So what I tend to do is I tend to do a follow-up call to the people that followed the link but didn't do the call to action that I wanted them to. And I position it as a customer service call. Just to basically say, uh, oh, I noticed you've been receiving my emails, you followed the link for the workshop I'm doing in a couple of weeks' time. Can I just double check my website's doing its job? Did you uh, find all the answers you were looking for? Or is there anything else I can help with? It's amazing how much extra results you sweep out of an email campaign when you position it as a customer service call. So anybody who is, is doing email campaigns, I would urge you to call just a small percentage of the ones that click through um, and just tell them you're doing a bit of customer service or some research on your website to find out if it's doing its job. Because your email campaigns drive people to your website and if it's not doing its job, then it's a, point, it's a waste of time. So, there's quite a bit I wanted to, to cover today, but there's a few myths and old-fashioned sales tactics that are, or the things that I, I don't agree with anymore that I'd like to share with you. Um, however, because this is a workshop, um, please feel free to put your hand up or ask me any questions or tell me if you disagree with anything that I'm saying. Okay, I'm used to it, ladies, being told I'm wrong, so that's fine. Just <laughs> hit me with as much stuff as you like. Um, to start with, who um, ever says or has heard the phrase, uh, each no is one step closer to your next yes? A few nods in the room. We, we tend to tell people this because it, it kind of gives them a thick skin and gets them used to dealing with rejection. My problem is, is I believe that two no's on the trot means you're either phoning the wrong people or you're taking the wrong approach, quite simply. 
And the problem is, is that people that get told that mentality and they slip into some bad habits go around collecting no's in the hope that after 99 no's, eventually one will say yes. Now, does anybody have too many leads coming through? Too much great data? No? If you can't afford to burn your referrals and your leads or your data, then don't force conversations with people who aren't ready to have a conversation with you right now. The other thing that we do uh, quite often when we, we take a new job and we're on the phone a lot, we're given a script. We're given a script of what our intro might be and a few objections, objection handling type situations. Now the problem that I have with this is that have you ever received a call from somebody who you can tell is reading? Yes. How do you feel when you're nodding there? How do you feel when they're, when they're reading down the phone? Well, you're not having a conversation with them. You're not engaged with them. They're just talking at you. Yes. So you don't actually feel engaged in the conversation. Any other feelings about it? Yeah. Yes. Well, what typically happens, I find, is that people are a bit nervous when they first pick up the phone, but they're told that this is the pitch, and that if you get all the way to the end of it, people are more likely to say yes. So the call often starts with, hello, my name's Anthony Steers, I'll hit you with a quick feature and a benefit, uh, and I'll talk really quickly so you can't interrupt me, and then when I come to the end of it, hopefully I get to all the way to the end of my pitch and you'll say yes or no. Well, this is the first form of what I call premature elaboration. This is when you blurt your pitch down the phone straight away without being given permission to speak. It does the same thing as, as reading, as being sort of caught out as reading a script. So, if you are going to get people to learn a script, make sure they learn it like an actor would and not, rather than trying to read it and keep it there like a reference tool. The other thing now is objections. Objection handling, you give people a, a list of all of the objections that might come up. Can we nod? Is, is this right? Do we? Yes? I typically don't think we should uh, be overcoming objections on, the, on a first call if it's a, a traditional lead gen outbound type call. Because I don't know if you know this, but um, objection handling is arguing. You're basically saying the excuse you've given me isn't good enough. I don't care if you can't afford it. We can do finance. Keep talking to me. Which often means we're not really taking the hint. So I tend to store up as many objections as I can so I can use them on the second call and then I get to put them on the table first and they can't use them to stop me. Last time we spoke, you said you didn't really have any budget. Is that still the case? And you say, yes, okay. Now I can start to address it without you throwing it at me like, stop, I don't want your services because I can't afford it. So there's quite a few bits that I want to um, cover today, but I also want you guys to tell me some bits that you want to know as well. So I've kind of second-guessed some useful bits, the most popular gems from my workshops. Um, but will you kind of talk to me as we go? Yes, I see some smiling faces and I see some people... No, I won't talk to you. We talk all day, we don't want to do that now, do we? Um, most people tend to assume that I'm a sales trainer because I work with lots of sales teams and it's one of the easiest things to measure. Uh, but the one thing that I would say is I actually believe I'm a customer service trader because I don't teach people how to sell, I simply show them how to help their customers to buy. That's exactly what it is I do. It's the reason, you know, um, we're contact centers now rather than call centers, a lot of us now say, because call centers has a bit of a bad ring to it. Is that right? Most contact centers have now realized that they used to have a sales department and a service department or a mixture of service departments. And they've realized that when you answer the phone and say, hello, sales, that the person that you're speaking to realizes they're speaking to a salesperson, and therefore they keep their cards close to their chest and they don't really allow you to do a solution sell and tell you what the problem is. They normally phone up and will ask you a particular question. A lot of contact centers have realized that when you answer the phone and say, good afternoon, service, that you believe you're talking to a customer service representative who's there to help you. And therefore, we're far more likely to be honest with them and put our cards on the table because we feel that they're there, they're there to help us rather than sell to us. So I look at the model of the car industry. Okay, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've noticed this, but um, on a, in the car industry, a good chunk of their website now is all dedicated to customer reviews. 
you started to notice that in all of their adverts, typically now a lot of them are the owners of the car driving around the town and all that kind of stuff. This is because there are three levels of trust when you're going to go and buy a car. At the very top of the list, we believe existing customers because they've driven the car and they know what it's like and they're going to give us some honest feedback. Then second on the list is the witch magazine, the neutral bodies that you can't bribe despite people trying. And then at the bottom of the list, unfortunately, is the sales guy that's in the showroom who's there, who you think is there to sell you the car. Which is why when I talk to people about perfecting their pitch, we use success stories from existing clients. That's what we share with them. We share testimonials and case studies that say, look, this is what our, our customers are saying about us. If you think we could do the same for you, I'd love to come and talk to you. But the car industry is actually really quite clever because all of their sales and marketing activity is not focused at selling cars, it's focused around getting test drives. You are 72% more likely to buy a car once you've driven it. So often when I work with companies that are doing lead gen type stuff, we come up with what our test drive is, which could be a free tip sheet, it could be a free consultation or a view of their existing solution. But when you pitch something as a test drive, it feels rather non-committal. There's no risk involved. It allows people to experience what it's like to work with us before actually parting with any money. Out of interest, we were chatting earlier on. Could you imagine if BMW phoned you up and basically said to you, you're on our database, but the reason that we're contacting you is we've got a new 4x4 and we're really interested in getting feedback from our female drivers out there. Would you like to borrow the car for the weekend? But in exchange, you have to give us some feedback of what it was like to drive and park and go shopping in. Would you happily, would you do that? Yeah. yeah? So I've given you this great sweet prize and I've told you what the catch is and the catch is really quite small. Yes? When you position what you do, particularly from a lead gen perspective as a, a test drive, people often want to bite your hand off. The problem is, is if it sounds too good to be true, then they question it and then they don't want to do it. Okay? But the car industry are really clever. They, they make a shed load of money. And consider... Yeah? That we used to do, that we used to ring people, we used to give away like the DJ, the golf ticket. Yeah? Set up a test drive. Set up a test drive. That's exactly In fact, I know somebody who's really senior for BMW Finance. When they do their follow up calls to the people who um, are finances are coming up for renewal, if they leave a message that says, Hello there, Mr. Smith, we notice your finance agreement is coming up for renewal. Could you give us a call back to discuss this, please? That nobody calls them back. When you leave a message to say, we notice that your uh, finance is coming up for renewal, we'd like to lend you the latest model of the car that you've got. If you'd like to borrow it for a, couple of, for a few days, please come back to me and we'll have a chat. They reckon about 8 out of 10 people phone them back for a test drive and will often then take the next car up. So not only do they use it to get new customers in, they continue to use it to keep their existing customers sweet as well. I only actually found that out less than a week ago and uh, they have uh, an after-service after survey where there, I believe, are five particular questions that everything revolves around these five questions. If, you're not, if you don't score 95%, you don't deserve to be a dealer. And that's all around, did you get offered a test drive? Were you followed up after your test drive? Okay, in fact, three, thing, three of the five questions, I believe, are all related around the test drive itself, which makes us think. So what I'd like to do is I tend to describe, who, who does lead generation or has a lead generation department? Nobody? Is it all inbound? Oh, there are some hands going up. Brilliant. Just the quick analogy that I tend to give is that when you're doing a lead generation call, I describe it as being like dropping off a pizza menu. I don't know if you've ever done this, but have you ever received, you get your takeaway menus through your door? Yeah? I get two from Domino's in one week sometimes. Two in one week. I don't eat that much pizza, I promise you. But what they do is usually on the front page is some subtle branding. There's usually some special offers there, something that might entice you to remember that the deal. Yes? Then they've got all their contact details on the menu. And what they're hoping is that that menu goes onto your notice board or to the drawer in the kitchen so that when you are hungry, you think of them and pick up the phone. Have you ever had one literally come and knock on the door? And you open the door and they go, oh, can I take your order, please? <laughs> That's ridiculous, right? If you phone up somebody, hopefully we all know that our phone calls interrupt somebody's day. Could we nod just an acknowledgement of that statement? Our phone calls interrupt somebody's day. If you phone up and expect that now is the right time to speak and that they want to buy from you right now, you are as rude or ridiculous as a pizza man knocking on your door and saying, can I take an order? 
your phone call is purely to establish a relationship and start building the, um, the credibility element and hopefully winning them over because what I say phone calls really do is they help us cultivate relationships. How many people, when they are doing the lead gen, turn their uh, initial phone call, try and turn that into a meeting so that somebody can go and see somebody? Is there much of that, or are we doing telephone appointments? You mentioned, lead, you put your hand up as lead generation. You do get appointments, brilliant. I wasn't sure if you were just asleep at the back or what's going on. Um, but typically, all we really want is a face-to-face -face meeting where people, we all know people by people. You guys have to nod at me so I know you're still awake. Yes, people by people, right? So I often ask this loaded question about what's your USP, your unique selling point. Has anybody got a really good USP for their company? You have a residential broadband without a phone line. Yes. Oh, you're the only person on the market who does that. You sure? No, I don't know. Oh. No, you're not, are you? Okay. Well, I'll be honest with you. It's central London, yes. It was a trick question. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can guarantee whatever you think your USP is, okay, unless it's what I'm about to tell you it is, then your competitors are probably saying exactly the same thing. Your only USP are the people within your business. That's the only thing that makes you any different from anybody else because your people have the ability to offer, offer a level of service that's well above everybody else. You are specific individuals, you all have a track record and your own unique uh, set of knowledge and skills. It is your people that make you different. I heard, uh, I was speaking in South Africa a couple of weeks ago, a recruitment um, in Darba, I think they called it, and there was two sort of stats that kind of stuck out. The first one was that over 95% of people don't leave their job, they leave their manager. Was one of them? Yeah? And if I'm honest with you, I've got a senior moment going on now and I can't remember what the second one is, but it will come back to me at some point, so don't you worry. Um, was that a noise from the back? Was that a question, maybe? No? Just shuffling. Okay, that's all right. Um, what I'm going to look at now quickly is I'm just going to give you what I consider to be like a first call structure. I don't write scripts anymore. The problem with the script is that one, people don't learn them, they tend to read them. But the second problem, and the biggest problem, is that the person that you're phoning hasn't been given a copy of your script. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but have you ever been in a conversation where it's gone on a complete tangent and it's gone on a totally random topic? The problem is, is if, you, if it goes off on a random topic, which it quite often does, and you try and stick to the script, you will distort the flow of the conversation. And as soon as you distort the flow of the conversation, alarm bells will go off that say, uh-oh, they're following a script, this is probably a sales call. So when I try and really get across to people, they think I'm going to turn up with this silver bullet, this closing line, this phrase that works every single time. I'm really sorry, I haven't got it. All I basically do is teach telephone etiquette. And the reason telephone etiquette is so powerful is because most of the industry in the market are so battered by the industry that they haven't got any manners. But I am delighted to see that most of the speakers and the topics going on around here today are all around customer service. So we value customer service. Yes, we do. Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Um, so call structures. Uh, this is just a quick one, so, and this is, this is like a first call type thing, really. Um, but typically, just so that you know, um, I tend to start all of my calls with a very similar sentence, which basically is me introducing myself, giving somebody a teaser, okay? I usually tell them, that I, um, my name's Anthony Steers, um, one of my directors has asked me to get in touch with you. Um, I just wanted to chat for a couple of minutes. When's a better time to call you back? And I always try and say, I only want two minutes, when's a better time to call you back? The reason that I do that is that they instantly think, if this is a sales call, I am rubbish, because I've made it so easy for them to get out of it. So that first alarm bell doesn't tend to go off. Now, we've all acknowledged that our phone calls interrupt somebody's day. Do you ever ask, is now a good time to talk? Can you talk for a couple of minutes? You typically get a no, right? A lot of people are busy. There is never a good time to talk. But if you say, I only need a couple of minutes, when's a better time to call you back? They instantly think, well, it's probably not a sales call, because otherwise he's rubbish. And they'll then go, well, there's never really a good time to call me back, but he only wants two minutes. Go on then, what's the call about, is typically the answer I get. Once I've been given that answer, I have been given permission to speak. That is the point where I can then start to explain what my teaser is. 
Now, my teaser is a compelling reason that is specific to that individual, because if it's not specific to them, it's a random cold call and they're going to feel like they're just on a list. So typically, I mentioned earlier on that the best way to perfect your pitch is to share a success story. So to give you um, an example, I worked with a, uh, lots of IT companies and uh, one of them, two of the directors used to work in the, well one of the directors, sorry, used to work in the recruitment world and he was the head of IT for the UK's biggest recruitment company many years ago. And then when I went to see them and they said we need some business development stuff, can you help us? We looked at who their existing clients were and we tried to find some niches where they could really establish and they own those niches. And we realized that they had nine clients that were all in recruitment. And that was half because he had a lot of contacts in that world anyway, but mainly because he'd become the go-to person because he was one of the first guys to build job boards and he built apps specifically for recruitment companies. So what we would ever do is we would phone people up and we would only ever really target recruitment companies and I would always phone them up and go, hello, my name's Anthony Steers. I'm uh, calling from Bunker 48. We're a technical and digital support company. Can I assume you've got your IT support covered? And they say, yes, I do, Anthony. I go, thank God for that. I was expecting that to be the case. And they go, because ah, they now realize that I realize I'm not going to sell to them on this first call. And now they've relaxed. All I've basically done is establish a potential future need. That's all I really want to do. Back to the pizza thing, all I really want to know is would you eat pizza and are you in my delivery radius? Okay, all you are trying to do in the first call is establish a potential future need so you can work out whether or not it's worth them staying in your database and working that prospect and trying to build a relationship with them. But there are other compelling reasons that we use all the time. In a business to business environment, we use LinkedIn a lot. Excuse the phrase, when I do mini masterclasses around LinkedIn, I refer to something that I call LinkedIn flirting, where, um, is anybody vain enough to admit that you look at who's been looking at you on LinkedIn? Yes? Don't worry, everybody does it, but most of us don't admit to it. Okay, but I go around looking at people I really want to speak with, but I don't send them a connection request usually. And sometimes I have to look at them every two days for about two or three weeks, and I wait for the day they look back at me, and then I phone them up and go, <gasps> And I sound all excited, I go, oh, I was just on LinkedIn and I noticed you look back at my profile. I found you a few days ago, but I didn't get a chance to send you a connection request. I was really excited that you, you look back at me. I'm going to send you a connection request now, but I just figured I should introduce myself. Now, a month ago, just before I disappeared to South Africa, I picked three out of nine people that looked at my profile. And I got a half-day training session with an IT company and a coaching client in Texas. The other guy pretty much said, I just saw the word telephone assassin and it intrigued me. I'm about to retire, I'll be honest with you. I just thought I'd have a look. <laughs> okay, but I use that as my specific reason for phoning that particular person. And usually when I talk about um, uh, doing research and preparing for a call, I'll show you how I use information on social media. I don't know if you realize this or if you do this yourself, but a lot of people overshare on social media. This information is like ammunition. Everybody's favorite topic is themselves. It is themselves, I guarantee you. You start asking people questions about themselves and they start talking. The more you know about somebody, the more flattering it is. And when you get details wrong, they don't mind correcting you and filling in the gap. So in this world where we've got so much technology and social media, and yes, we can beam our message all the way around the world, the quickest, cheapest, and easiest way for me to find a new customer is to pick up the phone and talk to some. I don't have to phone many. In fact, typically, I always say to people, because I use that same approach of, I just wanted to chat for a couple of minutes, when's a good time to call you back? I say, if I call 10 people, seven of them aren't even in, around or in the office, so they take about 15, 20 seconds. Two of them I get put through to, but they're a bit busy and they've got to finish off a tender or they're about to go into a meeting and they ask me to call back at a certain time. I'm going to call them back. I schedule it like a meeting. And then one out of ten says, well, I've got a couple of minutes now. What's it all about? And I have a proper conversation with that person. Who is targeted or targets their team on the number of calls they make in a day? Or call times, maybe? Okay. I'm, I'm, the reason I, I ask is I'm curious, because sometimes 
in certain call centers that I've been into, I get guys come up to me going, oh, I make 120 calls a day. Like I'm supposed to be impressed. And I go, wow, they must be going really bad. Because <laughs> I don't count my calls, I just make calls that count. I don't want to burn my way through my referrals. I don't want to use up all of my good data. Whose data is good in their database? Who, who doesn't get complaints about their data being rubbish from their team? Is that we all get complaints? I do. I flipped, this, flipped it around there. Yes. Databases are brilliant when they work properly. Just so you know, there's a little chap over here that I was talking to earlier on, and I quite rudely have forgotten his name already. Pete Muswell. Did you hear that? Pete Muswell. This guy cleans data. In fact, what he actually does is he checks the numbers are actually live and active and that they're not a recorded message that then tells you where the new number is that wastes the time of your people on the phone. Okay, typically, we were talking stats earlier on because I was fascinated by what he does and what the figures are and why more people don't know who he is. And usually, typical, around 30% of your data is rubbish. Absolute rubbish. He's got a great test drive, just so you know. We were talking about this earlier on. Give him a small percentage of your records and he'll tell you how many are actually correct and you can then do the maths of figuring out how much dead wood is actually in your database. Back to the call structure. Um, intro and teaser. You've always got to start by saying who you are okay, and where you're calling from, but you do have to give them a teaser and it does have to be a compelling reason that is specific to that individual. If you can't give them something specific or you haven't read your notes before you phone them, you're going to look like a typical cold caller and probably sound like an idiot. Don't know if you've ever done this before, but have you ever had a call go wrong, and then as soon as you put down the phone, you go, oh, I should have said this. Or, oh, I've just noticed in these notes, he said, don't call him before this time. And we start to dial without even really processing, which is why I say it's all about making calls that count. You will probably make a far less number of calls by doing a tiny bit of research and reading before you pick up the phone. And it's very annoying when you hit three, four, five voicemails on the trot. But I guarantee you, you won't be burning through your data and upsetting prospects because you don't really know what you're doing and you're coming across like a typical cold caller. All you are basically trying to do is establish a potential future need, qualifying them into your database. The middle part of the call is then all about timing. You know they need your service, but you now need to know when they're going to be hungry for your service. So if what you do is contracted, you want to know when their contract comes up for renewal. If what you do is project-based, you need to know the time frames or what's in the pipeline of the projects that might then involve your services. Typically, with sales trainers, I tend to find that they say that this part of the call is about objection handling. And as I mentioned earlier on, objection handling is arguing. If you overcome an objection, you move into the next phase of the conversation where the person on the phone feels that they're either feeling defeated or like you're in control of the call and all of a sudden they're going to start acting a bit differently. Okay, But the call can go off on any particular tangent that you want. My big advice here is take as many notes as you physically can because information is ammunition on the phone. When you phone somebody back and you do a follow-up call and you start telling them details of things they told you about last time and that they've forgotten that they told you, it shows, one, that you paid attention. Okay. Two, actually then allows you to do what most of us consider ourselves to be as solution sellers. We, are, we find out what the problem is so that we can offer a solution. But you can't do that on a first call, because I don't know about you, when I get called by a complete solution, I don't tend to share the weaknesses within my business or my finances or any of that kind of stuff with a complete stranger. I need to know that they are who they say they are. I want to check their website out first. I want to know that they've listened and paid attention to me. And I want to know that what they are going to talk to me about is specific to me. So when I go networking and people ask me what I do, if they beat me to the, to the punch, I say, I'm the telephone assassin. I help people with telephone techniques. What is it you do? Because once I know what it is you do as a business, I can then pick out a whole shed load of case studies and testimonials from companies that are probably very similar to yours and say, oh, okay, well, I've done this for these guys. These were the problems that they were having. And all of a sudden, I can outlay what it is I've done for my existing customers. And as soon as I start t touching on some of the points that are specific to you or your team, you'll go, ah, this guy knows his stuff. Every call tends to finish with two final steps. Just so that you know, you have to agree what the next action is going to be. You have to say out loud what they have asked you to do next or what they are going to do next. Okay? 
which could be phone me back at another time, could be send me some information. They could have even asked you some questions that you don't know the answer to. Okay? I often think not knowing the answers to all the questions on the first call is kind of useful because you can then say, oh, well, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Let me just go and check with the technical man and I'll come back to you. So people, if you've got anybody in your teams that are scared of not knowing the answer, get them to say this to just one customer. When they ask a question, say, I don't really know. Um, I don't really know the answer to that question. Would you like me to guess? Because your clients don't want you to guess. They want to know a specific answer. But whatever that action is, you have to say it out loud. And then you must take final responsibility for the next time you speak to them. So if it is a customer service type inquiry um, or a um, complaint, we should be taking responsibility for following that up in a week or two weeks' time to just double check that everything did get resolved. Were they happy with the way we dealt with their issue or their complaint? Have they had a chance to read the information that we sent them? Typically, if, if I'm doing lead gen stuff and people are asking for more information to be sent, um, when they give me their email address, I tend to spell it back to them. The reason I do that is because it suggests that I pay attention to detail and it cuts out that really embarrassing phone call where you go, uh, your email keeps bouncing back. How do you spell your surname again? And looking like an idiot. But if I send information to somebody, once I have double checked um, that this is the right place to send it to, I say, okay, are you likely to get a chance to have a look at that in the next week or two? Because that's not really a, a tight time frame, and most of us go, well, yeah, I should get a chance. Or they'd even answer and say, well, I'll actually, I'll look at it tonight. I say, well, brilliant. Look, as long as I know you're going to get a chance in the next week or two, then let me know because, um, or oh, well, let me know if there's any urgent or immediate questions, but I'll make a note in my diary so that I don't forget about you to just give you a courtesy call in two weeks' time, just to make sure the email got through your spam filter. Obviously, life happens, you might not get a chance to call me back. Most people don't have an issue with us doing a follow-up call if it's one to two weeks after that initial call. It still gives them a chance to come back to you with a response, but it means you stay in control of the next time you're going to speak to them. That's the biggest issue with, with data that goes out of date, is people don't put a follow-up date on the record, and it sits and gets buried and buried and buried under more data that nobody wants to touch anymore because it's old. Um, there's one quick thing that I do want to show you. I've just been given my five-minute warning already, so this has really flown by. Um, this is the example I give of a, uh, how you can set up a, a spreadsheet as a um, CRM-type system. There's three boxes that I'm going to point out. Firstly is, um, obviously, the ones in black writing are things you would expect to be in a database. Yes? Contact details, obviously, these are usually broken up into different fields. Down here, most of us must track the source of where our leads come from. Yes? Brilliant. Uh, I want to know that for a particular reason, but I have uh, client types here. So I've got different types of clients. I have CTs for training, I have CSs for speaking, CCs for coaching, and CAs for my assassins. Okay? But I also have strategic partners who I work closely with and we swap leads, and I have introducers as well. The reason I want to know about this is because this, combined with this information here, tells me who my best referral partners are, and therefore how I find better referral partners going forwards. But the thing that I'm really wanted to point out is this grading or point system. <coughs> because this is what I think should be measured in a lot of contact centers. So the simple uh, scoring system on here that I use particularly, this is just for lead gen typically, one point means we've got a decision maker's name, two points means we've spoken to them, three means they've requested information to be sent, four means we've followed it up, and five means we've got a meeting. The reason that point system is useful is you should be targeting your staff on scoring points every day because every point they score pushes somebody through the sales process. There's a couple of advantages here is that you and them uh, can see where the bottlenecks are within the sales process. So this basically means that you may find that you two could be sat in the same office, you're great at having the initial conversation and getting people to receive information, but your closing meetings is not as good as the lady next to you, who doesn't send out half as much as he does, however you close more meetings. So once we know where your strengths are, we'll say, well, in which case, can you listen to him for an hour and hear how he opens the door and gets the stuff sent out, and can you listen to her for an hour and figure out how she asks the closing question? And you can then learn from each other. But the beauty of it is, is that I don't know if you've ever had this before. Oh, I normally make people answer a ringing phone. Um, oh, and I've lost my trail now. I hear a ringing phone. I get all excited. Um, 
I don't know where I was going with that. There we go. Sorry about that. I'm having a few senior moments now. Once I turn 30, it all went downhill, I'm telling you. Um, but the, I think the point system is good. One, I don't know, yeah, this is what I was going to say. Have you ever found that you have a good day on the phone, but you don't get all the meetings that you wanted to book? You feel like you've had a positive day on the phone, but the three meetings you were supposed to book, you haven't even booked one. And then you have two days like that on the trot, and your boss starts going, well, what have you been doing all day? It's Wednesday, you booked one appointment, what are you doing? You can kind of defend yourself by saying, well, I'm scoring this many points, okay? But the beauty from a management perspective is you get to see where the bottlenecks are. So you can either pair up people to learn from each other. You might start saying, well, actually, let's split this now. You two can share commission. You open the door and you close them. Or you might say, get somebody like me to come in and work with this side of the room that struggle with the getting past the gatekeeper and these ones over here that struggle with the closing. And you can then tailor the skill gaps that, that are missing. Make sense? Brilliant. Um, I'm not really going to get a chance to do this, and some of you may have seen this line anyway. I didn't say he stole the money. This is what I use to emphasize why people should be spoken to rather than emailed or, or messaged. Because if you say that with a very single tone, it's very much as it is on the tin. I didn't say he stole the money. That's what it means, right? I didn't say he stole the money. However, if I put emphasis on any one of those words, but we keep them in the same order, then it totally changes the meaning of the sentence. So I didn't say he stole the money, now suggest somebody else did, yeah? I didn't say he stole the money, I now seem cross that you think I did. Well, I didn't say he stole the money, I merely suggested, okay? The reason that I point this out is one, to all of the marketing people in the room, whatever message you think is jumping off of your email campaigns may not be. I don't know if you've ever received a text message, usually from your other half, but from somebody who you think is in a mood with you, and you add your own tone to the message, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but there's a couple of other advantages. One, you can plant the seed of doubt. You should never slate your competition, but you can certainly suggest you'll give a better service. But two, you can actually read between the lines of what people mean. And that's how you become really powerful on the phone, where you go, oh, well, actually, the way you said that suggests that that's not 100% of the picture. Can you tell me a bit more? It shows that you're tuned into the conversation. There's a speaker called Nigel Risner, who's a fantastic speaker, and he says, when you're in the room, be in the room. He says, if you go to a conference or you're going to a meeting, no time for daydreaming, be focused. So I pinched half of his phrase and tweaked it a bit. When you're on the phone, be on the phone. Yeah? Have a handset or, an ear, or a, a headset that's turned up loud enough. I hate that when I answer the phone. I go, hello, Anthony speaking. They go, hi, can I speak to Anthony Steers, please? Ah, oh, so you're already not listening to me. Perfect way to start the call, thanks. Um, but from a time perspective, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that they're going to kick me out soon. Um, but is there any particular questions or things that you were hoping I was going to address while we're in here today? Is that a tick, tick, tick? I've covered everything you were expecting? Or? I'm going to be sticking around for a bit anyway, so feel free to come and chat to me. Um, if you do come and chat, I do ask people what their gems are. Okay, 90% of what I say you already knew, right? 70% of it you probably already use. All I really want people to take is one or two little gems that they can put into practice that will increase their conversion ratio of the number of people that they get through to and the number of decent conversations they can actually get into. Okay. Um, I always talk about getting feedback from people, uh, getting testimonials on LinkedIn. The reason I want a testimonial on LinkedIn from people is that it tells all of your connections that you said something nice about me, which means a small percentage of their connections will look at what you've written, and an even smaller percentage of those will click on my picture and look at my profile. And the day they look at my profile, I pick up the phone all excited and go, oh, I've just noticed you've been looking at me on LinkedIn and you're connected with John who's just written me this lovely testimonial. Did you read it? And I reinforce that good news message and it's specific to them, they, they get all excited and they smile like you did, like I was phoning you, okay? And they go, oh, wow, oh, he actually phoned me. Um, testimonials, uh, I don't want any testimonials for at least two weeks, so anybody who writes me one, I won't include them on my profile, uh, because without sounding rude, I don't care if you feel warm and fuzzy and motivated to pick up the phone when you leave the room. What I care about is what you actually put into action and what then happens as a result of it. My clients don't care that I made you feel a warm and fuzzy by the end of the session. What they care about is that you actually took something away and put it into practice and increased your results. If you know other people that need help, please spread the word about the telephone assassin. People even usually just remember the haircut as we were talking about earlier on. Uh, but as part of my training, I do live call demonstrations at the end of my sessions. It's the big thing that, in fact, the last thing be in my bonnet that I'm going to share before I leave um, is 
Most companies that I work with, it's the managers that are the issue within the business because they often got their position managing a team because they were really good on the phone and now all of a sudden they're a manager so they don't need to be on the phone anymore and they like to bark orders and delegate and be manager. The reason I earn respect of everybody I train is because I have the guts to pick up the phone and make live calls to their customers showing them the structure and the techniques that I talk about in action. It's that light bulb moment where people go, oh my God, it really is that easy. This guy knows nothing about our products and services, yet he's had a really positive call, he's got us a great lead, this is what we want. So if you are a manager, okay, or you've got managers underneath you, I would strongly recommend that you get them to work very closely with their team and to put their money where their mouth is and show how they earned their manager's job in the first place and pick up the phone. That's how you get the respect of your team. Yes, sir? A five-point system, yes. It, uh, one point is that we know who the decision maker is. Two points is I have to move around to keep the camera around on his toes. Uh, two means that um, I've spoken to them. Three means that they have requested information. Four means that it's been followed up. And five means it's a meeting. I have worked when I do internal training with a company that has a 27-point system. They have bonus points. You get one bonus point for asking for a referral, two if you get one. Um, they, there was one coffee company that got a bonus point if they found out what somebody's favourite drink was when they booked the appointment. So that when they turn up and they do their demo, they're already passing them their favourite drink when they give it. Rather than saying, and what is it you drink? And delaying it and going, actually, no, we're so prepared, there you go. But the point system, I think, really works because it actually gives you something useful to measure rather than call times or call numbers. So the one thing I really want to leave you with is don't count your calls, just make calls that count. Thank you very much.